Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Uh, today, I was going to do it as a standalone service, a standalone message um, called Stretch, but the 8 o'clock were like, no, this needs to be a series. And so it went from a Sunday sermon to it's going to be a series uh, for the next two more weeks, three weeks. It'll be a three-week series. And you don't want to miss. How many got the rubber bands? Did you get your rubber band? Okay. If you got a rubber band and you haven't put it on you, on your wrist, put it on your wrist. And then, you know, do this for me real quick. Just do this real quick. That'll wake you up. Some of you are way too quiet. You got that on your wrist? The reason I got this rubber band is because I want it to be a constant reminder, not only this week, but especially today, that your faith is useless if it's not stretched. It's useless. Just like this rubber band. This rubber band is useless unless it meets its fullest potential. And I know that so many of us, we, we, we desire to be people of faith. We desire to believe God for things. We desire to believe God for healing and breakthroughs and victories and miracles. But how many know that you can have all the desire, you can think faith all you want, but God wants to stretch your faith. God wants you to really trust him and believe him and not only have information, but he wants to take the word that he allows us to receive as we read our word, as we hear a message, and to go into action, right? This rubber band right now, think about this. I have a lot of feedback. Can we get uh, Stephen in here? Uh, this rubber band right now is at its minimal potential right now. Minimal. That, that, that same applies to your faith. Your faith right now is at a minimal potential. And if you can just accept that reality, then you'll always think, what else do I need to do to stretch my faith in order for me to accomplish what God wants me to do? And God does not want us to be at a minimal. Minimal would be me, me going to church every Sunday, listening to a message, singing some songs, throwing out some amens, maybe a hand clap or two, and then go home and default back to who I really am. That would be minimal. That's cool. I believe in God. I believe he exists. You know, I believe what the pastor's saying. I believe what the word says. But going from I think or I believe what this says to now I'm going to take the actual word and I'm going to put this word into action is a whole other level. And we do. We, have, we are indated with information. But God doesn't want us just to have information. Being Just having information that this is a rubber band is not enough. This rubber band was created with a purpose. You were created with a purpose. Your faith was given to you with a purpose. You have more than enough faith to accomplish whatever it is that you need to accomplish. You have more than enough faith to see the victory, the miracle, the breakthrough that you want to see. But you cannot see it if you're going to stay at a minimal state for the rest of your life. Can I get an amen? amen. So say that with me. Say, uh, my faith, my faith. is useless. Unless it's, Unless it's stretched. Look at your number and be like, we're stretching today. All right, let me give you a quick, a quick definition of faith. Faith is being less certain but more confident at the same time. So often we think that faith is, is God doing everything he said and it all better work out. Uh, there better be no mistakes. There, 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 there better be a breakthrough. But the truth is this, is that when you actually step out in, in faith in doing something, whether it's financially, whether it's your family, whether it's starting a new business, how many know that it's not always certain? It's not certain that your business is going to blow up. It's not certain that people are going to come to Elevate Church. It's not certain. When you are going to step out and to do something that is bigger than you, you're going to experience a lot of uneasiness, uncertainty, you're going to have a, but, but when you know Christ, when you have faith in Christ, you will begin to develop this confidence that it's going to work out. I don't know how, but I'm confident that God is faithful in this. Do you hear what I'm saying? So let's read this again. So faith is being less certain, but, but 
more confident at the same time. For example, let's just, let's just take the, this rubber band, okay? Take it off your, your, your wrist real quick. We're going to do some exercises today. So check that. Okay, so everybody just do this with it. Okay, minimum potential, okay? What happens when, when, when you start pulling on this right here, right now? Look at this. Start doing that. Now leave your hands right there. Don't stop. What do you start feeling? Pressure. Pressure tension. tension. What, what else do you feel? Resistance. Huh? I love that. Listen, the, the truest form of faith is when you are resistant. So, so think about it. But check this out. Let's go beyond that. What else do you feel? Do you feel the muscles in your arm? Can you feel like your chest like working out right now? It's getting like tight, right? Huh? Don't you feel it? Stay like that. Do you feel it in your arms? Right? Huh? Can you, listen, can you imagine staying like this with me throughout the entire service? How do you think you're going to feel? Uncomfortable. Tired. You're going to start feeling a little bit of exhaust. You're going to start cheating every so often and do this. And, and, and then you're going to be like, okay, he's looking at me. And you're going to go right back. That's, that's what church people do. Like when you're not listening, then I look at you like, oh, yeah, yes, pastor. Amen. Take it. I already know. I can, hey, FYI, I can see you. I see everything up here. Amen. So, so think about this. That's what God wants. God does not want us to be at a place of comfort. God wants us to be uncomfortable in his presence, but he will be comfortable with you. And so often we don't want to be uncomfortable. We want easy. That's the problem with our society. Our society wants easy. Our society wants predictability. Our society wants comfort. You just want to feel good good all the time especially when you come to that place of christianity you think that just because you are a born again christian now you have this sense of i'm privileged therefore i should not experience any form of trial pain challenges suffering and that is the wrong gospel i don't know what gospel you're reading because when you look at the bible Every single man and woman of God who were following God's divine plan for their life experienced all kinds of trials, all kinds of challenges. They always had a belief for their next meal, belief for their business, because you know, they weren't born into ministry. All these people had jobs. You think the apostle Paul started in ministry? No, he was a tent maker. Jesus was a carpenter. Peter was a fisherman. Matthew was a tax collector. Luke was a doctor. They all had jobs. Believing that God would bless them. So don't get so religious and think that I can just go ahead and use my own ability, my own talent, my own gifting, and I can just provide for myself for the rest of my life. Your faith was given not only to bless you, but to bless others with it. To believe God for others. To stand with others. So faith is being less certain but it's being more confident at the same time because I'm not always certain about everything. How about you? And so when you think about this rubber band faith, you have to realize that if this rubber band requires tension, pressure, and all the things y'all said, okay, how much more does my faith require that of me? God requires us to be sometimes under tension, sometimes under pressure, sometimes in a place of or seasons of of you know, chaos or like God will allow certain things, but it's to build our character. It's to grow us because right now we're, most of us, we're at such a minimal. I think we're all at a minimal because even if you're at a little stretch, God says, I can stretch you some more. For example, I did the math on this. This is a uh, rubber band size 64. So I'm like, what the heck's a 64? Like what? The? I looked it up and what it means is, 64, the size 64 for this rubber band, it, it has been said by the creators of this rubber band that this rubber band has the great potential to stretch out to 17 inches. You're not surprised. Okay, you're awesome. I was like, wow. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, Because you know what happens is when you have only one rubber band, and let's say you're working at an office, and you got a stack of papers, you know, and it's your last rubber band, most of us are afraid to try to put that rubber band on there because what might happen? Let me tell you something. Your faith does not always work. 
And the reason we don't step out in faith is because we're afraid that we're going to break along the way. But aren't you glad that the creator knows how to fix broke? God knows how to restore. God knows how to mend back together again. So God would not give you something, right, to just sit on your blessed assurance and never do nothing with it. God has given you a mustard seed of faith to use it for his holy purposes. And just sitting on it is not enough with God. You will answer to God for that. I hope you're getting this. It's going to require you to stretch like a rubber band. And so what's the problem? Most people want to be, they want everything easy. They want things predictable. Like, man, don't change the song, Pastor. That's my jam. Why did y'all stop doing my jam? Well, we want predictable. Aren't you glad that you come to church that is unpredictable? You never know what we're going to do. We're always trying to step it up. We're always trying to grow. We're always trying to do something new. Amen? We're always trying to reach. We're always trying to see how we can help people around the world. It's not just predictable, let's go to church, let's lift a hand. No, it's like, how can, we, how can we build a school? How can we open churches? How can we send people? How can we rescue children? How can we help broken people? How can we stir the faith within people? How can we elevate lives? How can we change children's lives? We're always thinking, God, stretch us until you get stretched. So you can't live safe faith is a risk it's a risk that you might fail it's a risk that you may sink faith is not always working and operating at 100 percent. as a matter of fact when you look at the study and i know there's a lot of arguments but they say science says that humanity has and the only capacity humanity has is 10 percent of their brain usage but do you realize that, that if you study that further, the average person only uses 5% out of the 10%? So just think, imagine if you and I were operating at our, well, I'm hoping I'm at 10, but anyways, but what if, what if, what if you and I started tapping into 6% of that brain, 7% of that brain? Think about the innovation, the creation, the things that you can begin to establish, the things that you can begin to set up for your family, for your personal life, also for others. Just imagine, well, just think about your faith. How many of you right now are probably min- at the minimal 5% when God has given you way more? And how many know that God would not give you more than you can handle? God knows how, he knows how far to stretch you. He's a father. He's a nurturer. Do you think God wants you to break? No. But like any father, when you're trying to train your child how to ride a bike, you expect them to fall. It's okay. You expect them to make mistakes. You expect them to, you know, tip over. When they're walking, you can't just be like this the whole rest of their life. Like, don't fall, don't fall. Can you imagine a grown person and parents still right there like, don't fall? (laughs) No, you got to go ahead and release. You got to trust at some point that you got this. Too many of us, we're just walking around like, just, okay, God, just hold me, hold me, hold me. God's like, come on, man. I gave you mustard seed faith. Do something with it. Don't sit on it. Faith is risky. That's why we need to put our faith in Christ, in Jesus. That's where your strength comes from. That's your anchor. That's your help. That's your strength. That's your peace. That's your confidence. Outside of Jesus, you're always going to live uncertain. You'll even question God. But God wants to change that for us today. Come on. Say it with me. I got rubber band faith. Stretch me. Slap yourself again with that rubber band. Wake up. Ouch. Some is a little violent. They like it. They're like. (laughs) Calm down. You're in church, man. Listen. Starting this church was a stretch. I can still remember when my wife got here. Stop snapping yourself. (laughs) Weird now. We didn't want to be here. Can you imagine that being the church, I mean the pastor of your church, and you don't want to come to church? That's how bad it was. You know why? Because New Hall was not the New Hall you see today. Elevate Church is not the church that you get to experience every single week here. It wasn't the same. When we first got here, it was just so depressing. And many of you already know the story, but this is for those that haven't heard it. Man, our worship sucked. (laughs) Our preaching sucked. Everything was because God gave us a word. 
And God said, build me a church in the worst neighborhood of Santa Clarita, California, known as the armpit of Santa Clarita. It stunk. That's what they knew Santa Clarita. I mean, Newhall as people. I wish I could say people were coming by the droves. No, people were staying away by the droves constantly. This church was, we were constantly having to believe God for $100, for $300. So many of us, we expect that faith should already produce the final result. But how many know that faith is a constant process and you never arrive? You're always getting better. You're always stretching more. But if you have been living at your minimal potential, and you're still doing the same thing, thinking the same way. You're not trusting God. You, you're not willing to take a step of faith. You're not willing to sink. You're not willing to fail. If you're always afraid of risk, let me tell you something. That's not faith. Faith is risky. Faith is trusting God. Faith is believing God. Obviously, we didn't start a church because we're like, oh, I want to be a pastor. Didn't want to be a pastor. Didn't want any of this. All that you see, didn't want any of it. But God said, stretch. God said, this is what I want you to do. And then we had to put our works along with our faith, and we had to go at it. And I know that right now, some of you, you're sitting there, and you're uncomfortable because God has been telling you to do something. But you just feel like you don't have the, the, the smarts. You don't have the, the education. You don't have the, the ability. Let me tell you something. What you can't do on your own, faith can do for you. God can renew your mind. God can do something. So often when I meet with people or I do interviews with people or, or magazines or radio or whatever, they always think, they're like, hey, what university did you go to? I'm like, man, I went to Bible University. Like, okay, which one? Uh, the Bible. <laughs> what do you mean by that? I opened it every day, read it for four hours a day, and I would never stop. I started seeking God, and then God started renewing my mind. He started changing the way I thought. He started changing the way I perceived. He started changing the way I did life. As a matter of fact, obviously, it started with the word, but then it, I had a responsibility to start doing my due diligence and studying and reading and learning and growing and, and getting around the right people and, and asking the right questions and stretching myself when I remember I was not a good communicator because I came from a lack of education. I came from a lack of finances. I came from a lack of love. I came from a lack of a lot of things, but I could have lived the rest of my life like a victim them, or I had to make a choice and believe that faith was going to elevate me to the level that God wants me. But I have to stretch. And so I don't know where you're at, but you got to stretch. You can't just sit there and allow your life to go year after year after year and nothing changes. This church started with poverty. But let me tell you something. It may have been in a community of poverty, but it was filled with rich thinking. Now, I'm not talking money. I'm talking being richly blessed in faith, richly blessed in faith. And God has been so good to us. Faith always thrives in resistance, guys. It thrives. That's, that's where God is. That's where God shows up. That's where God lives. If you think that God lives in, in, in you know, predictability, in safe zone, no, God lives off the shore. He lives in the depths. He lives in the deep. And he's waiting and calling you, come on, let's do this thing. Everybody say, stretch faith. Stretch. It's going to stretch you. You're going to have tension. You're going to have pressure. You're going to have challenge. You're going to have all these different things, but it's necessary. Why? Because the purpose that God places in your life is so much greater than the tension. I know you don't like it. I don't like to be stretched. When God says, build me a school, I'm like, uh, that's great. We got no money. <laughs> How's that going to work? And then in another country. And we knew nobody there. How's that going to work? But God didn't ask me what the problems were. He gave me a word of what I need to do for him. My job is to seek him and to get counsel and to get wisdom and to connect with different people. And I have to realize that even though it was a stretch to open a school, I wish, I wish I could tell you, man, it was the most easiest thing we ever did. Hell no. <laughs> it's funny. The moment we started the school, you know what happened in Oaxaca? It's funny. Everywhere we go, something happens. 
Even Japan, while we were there, my wife and I, we were in, in the earthquake there. It's funny. It, something always happens. We open, we go to Oaxaca, we start building the school. Something happened with the, the government and the people. You know what they started doing? They started burning the whole city down. While we were doing construction with our missionaries. And I had to look at our team, be like, hey, guys, this is so unsafe because people were getting killed. And I'm like, okay, so here's the deal. Uh, I know that God brought us here on mission, but I give you permission to go back home because our life is on the threat zone right now. And this can get very dangerous. We're talking gunshots. We're talking places being burned, violence. I, I almost got, uh, 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 what do you call that? Uh, I'm sorry, abducted at, in a taxi. I did. The dude started taking me. I'm like, bro, I'm over there. He's like, no, no, this is faster. This is closer. I'm like, no, bro, I know where I'm going. <laughs> and I had to tell him, dude, if you don't stop this, I'm a, I'll beat you down. <laughs> I mean, I would pray for him afterwards, but I'm like, you ain't. <laughs> I would have been Christian-like Christian -like afterwards, but I'm like, no, nah, bro, you ain't taking me over there. Where you going? And I told him, like, dude, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. If you don't get me off, I'm good. We're, both gonna, we're both gonna die right now. And he turned around and he brought it back. So I told the mission, I'm like, guys, uh, this, is, this, is, this is dangerous. It's a stretch. But not one of those guys left. And we finished the project. And so often when hell breaks loose in your life, you know what the first thing is? You use that as an excuse to say, you know what, maybe this wasn't God's vision. God's, listen, God's not dumb. When God gives a word, he gives it, and his word does not return void. His word accomplishes everything he promised it would accomplish. The question is, will we stretch to see the promised land? I hope this is helping someone. So your faith will be tested. Let's look at real quick, 1 Peter 1, 7. Look at this. It says, these trials will show that your faith is what? Genuine. Your faith is what? Genuine. It's real. It's genuine. When you're being tested by all kinds of trials and challenges, when you're stepping out to do something incredible, it's going to be tested. It should be tested. You know why? Because when your life is tested, then it really shows how genuine you are in that place of faith. It also shows you whether or not you're raw and you're real about what you want to accomplish. It will show you whether you're a fake or it will show you whether you're real. And it's hard to find real deal people nowadays, isn't it? There's so much fake out there. God wants the real deal. He says, it'll show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is more precious than mere gold. Isn't that good that God says, you know what? All the money you can make on the world can't even compare with your faith. So often we put our focus, our motivation is money, money, money. God's like, see, that's why I won't bless you the way I want to bless you. You may have money, 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 but you don't have a good night's sleep. I say, let's get some money, money, money with a good night's sleep. Come on, there's nothing more than having the peace of God that surpasses all understanding while you're making all the income that you want to make. Amen? That's what God wants for us. And so, but what does he say? He says that your faith is much more precious than any gold. In other words, God's saying your currency on this earth is faith. Your currency in order to make it to heaven is faith in his son Jesus. Outside of that, you are broke spiritually. And God's saying that's not how it works. So he says it's far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, do you say some trials? Many. It will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You know what really blesses me about this verse is that when you, when you look at something that is beyond you and you remained strong in the midst of whatever trial, whatever chaos you experience, when you see the fruit of your labor, man, it, you can't help but to say, praise God. You can't help to say, man, it wasn't me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I don't have all the skill set. I'm telling you, this, all this glory goes back to the one who helped me make it happen. You bring all the glory back to Jesus, right? And you know what that does? When you start learning to operate in, in rubber band faith, eventually when you start seeing fruit after fruit, reward after reward, you start growing and honoring God. That's why we have to live in faith. 
because it starts teaching us, man, I better respect God a little bit more because he is legit. He is real. Man, sometimes we can be unfaithful, but God remains faithful. And then that in return, it's like his love. His love compels us to obey him. That's, that's why we keep coming. That's why you came today, because you love God. You want to you grow more with God. You want to learn more about God. And, and whether you started off with the wrong motive, like I'm here because they made me come to church. That's well, okay, but you're here. By the time you leave this place, you're going to be like, man, God is awesome. He's legit. Wow, God cares about my personal life. But he also cares about my family life. He also cares about my work life. God cares about everything. Give God a big hand clap. And, and let me tell you something. There are going to be moments where you're going to be on your highs. There are going to be moments where you're going to have, like, progress. And you're going to be moving forward. And, and things will be great. But let me tell you something. Uh, just like there's mountaintops, man, there are some nasty valleys. Man, fear will start hitting you. You'll start, you'll start questioning God. You'll start doubting God. Look, look, look at what 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9 says. It says, look at this. We are hard-pressed. Every disciple has experienced this on every side. Sounds like a rubber band, doesn't it? We are hard-pressed. Look, we are hard-pressed on every side, every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair. That word perplexed means, man, there's moments where we are confused. There are moments where we feel we are lost, but not in despair, not losing hope. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Look at this. Struck down, but not destroyed. And that's what faith does. You have to remind yourself that you're going to have moments in your life where you're going to have some serious lows, but but just because you're in a place of a serious low does not mean that God is absent from your life. God is there. God is stretching. God is growing. What the devil meant for God, uh, what the devil meant for bad, God will use it for something good. And before you know it, you'll start coming out of it as you start putting your trust back in him. It's the most amazing thing. So, man, that's the test that we have to experience. That test begins to show you the potential that's inside of you. You start seeing like, man, you know what? That wasn't so bad after all. I look at the school now that we built in Mexico and other things that we're doing, building church. Like I'm like, oh, it's easy now. But I didn't start off that way. It was so difficult. It was hard. But now I'm like, you know what? You know what happens? You start gaining rhythm. You start gaining momentum. You start getting more knowledge. And you start learning what not to do. You start learning what works and what doesn't work. You grow in wisdom. You grow more in faith. So when God says, okay, now do this for me, you already know, well, if he did it then, he'll do it again. And if you'll do it now, you'll do it tomorrow. And you start, you start having more confidence, but you always have uncertainty. When you step out with God, it's always going to be uncertain. Because you don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. You don't. That word perplexed also means that you don't have it all. You feel like, man, I don't know how this is going to work. Well, that's why we have to pray under the whisper of our tongue. God, if you don't show up, man, I'm going down. And God starts coming in and showing up and showing up, and then you give him all the, all the glory. Rubber band faith. Look at this, Hebrews eleven six. 6. It says, but without faith. Because I think that sometimes we think faith is only to obtain. No, you need to be vulnerable in order to get closer to God. You have to be real with God. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Man, I don't know about you, but I want to please God the best I can. Well, the only way in the entire Bible that you can please God is found in Hebrews eleven six. You have to have faith in him. And look what he says. He says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think that's the place where many of us have to get back to diligent I don't I don't got no faith are you diligent are you seeking diligently seek him and then I love it because he says he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him in other words he'll reward your faith he'll reward your stretch he'll bless your stretch and so there are a lot of people that have faith in a lot of you know worldly things earthly things 
but the faith we're talking about is faith to do the supernatural. Faith to do what's impossible with you is possible with God. I'm talking about that kind of faith. Because you already have gift. Many of you, you got it. You, you, got, you can go work, make money. No, okay, is that, is that going to be your story? Or are you going to have a God story where, man, you had crazy faith to see amazing miracles? Uh, here's the point. I want you to look at this on the screen. The value is not in the idea of faith. The value is in the stretch of your faith. And so many times we, like, for example, you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I value what you're saying, Pastor. I value that verse. That's so good. I didn't see that verse that way. But how many know that thinking is not enough? It's not just value the idea like, oh, I like this idea of faith. I like this guy. Man, I like how he says faith and, you know, I like his definition. That's good. That's not where you put the value. You put the value in the stretch. See, we like the idea of blessing, but we don't like the idea of the process. Because the process gets ugly, just like your healing. You like the idea, I want healing. Well, guess what? There's a process to that healing. Well, I want breakthrough. Well, guess what? There's a process to that breakthrough. Well, I want my family to come to Jesus. Well, guess what? There's a process for your family to come back to Jesus. Everything has a process. So don't just value the idea. Value the stretch. Value it. Say, man, ah, I like the idea, but I'm ready for the stretch. Stretch me, God. And, and allow yourself to be uncomfortable for a minute, and you watch what God will do. So the value is when I stretch my faith to please God. And that's when God does some big stuff. Isn't that good stuff right there? Do you see why I want to send myself an offering today? Yeah. <laughs> Say with me, faith is where God lives. Faith is where God lives. If you want to find his, his home, go to, uh, go to faith. Because that's where he lives. That's where he that's where he thrives. That's where he rewards. That's where he blesses. And how many know that we all have enough faith? Everyone here. And I know that many sometimes have that religious mindset. And, and it's religion. It's, it doesn't make you a bad person. It's just that there's a lot of religious mindsets out there. Like, I've heard people say things like, man, you know what? You know, how can so-and-so got their miracle and we didn't? Maybe I didn't have enough faith for it. That's a lie. God gives the same amount of faith to everyone. Now, what you do with it is on you. Or you hear people say like, man, I don't got faith like so-and-so. How come I can't have faith like that? You do have it. You just haven't used it. You haven't, you haven't even started yet. And so there's always these, these religious mindsets that we have created in us, and we start believing that. I don't know why some people get miracles and others don't. I honestly don't know. I don't even get into that because trust me, I've been in those moments where we've had some pretty serious stuff happen in our home, in our family, but I can't explain it. But it doesn't stop me from stretch. It doesn't stop me from believing. Don't, get, don't become so religious where you start, you start putting the pressure on you thinking that you weren't good enough, that you didn't have enough faith, that you didn't have enough trust. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The devil will, man, he will keep you there he will make you camp there for the rest of your life and then you'll be paralyzed and then your faith is inactive and then you never do one thing again for God so I pray that you break that off of your life you have enough faith look let's look let me show you in the scripture how it's it's what Jesus said in Matthew 17 20 verse 21 he says this he says what I'm about to tell you is true if you have faith as small as a mustard seed it is enough it is enough you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And I know that when you look at this, sometimes you start thinking like, man, there's got to be a formula to this faith. No, there is no formula to God's faith. It's you knowing that he already gave it to you. You're not trying to create it. It's already done. I gave you mustard seed faith. And that is not something that we start saying like, man, maybe I need to get my faith supersized. Like, maybe I need to get the 2019 version of faith. No, God doesn't change. God, God's faith has been the same for 2,000 years. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you're good. You can tell that mountain, be removed, and it will obey you. You will begin to see the impossible happen as you start stretching your faith. We're not trying to exchange this current faith and be like, man, my faith sucks right now. Maybe I need, uh, I need the newest model. No, take what God gave you and do something with it. Do something with it. Once again, faith is being lesser than, but 
but more confident at the same time. And I've had to learn how to do this. It's not easy. It's not easy because God wants us to be certain in the sense of we have potential to be more, to do more for him. Like that should be where my faith is in. God, you can do more with my life. You, you, can, you, can, you can do more. You can, you can be more for him. As you read the Bible, you start seeing also different levels of faith. Like there's dimensions of faith that is just shocking. Like you look at the Bible like, man. Oh, let's look at Peter. Look, look at this. Matthew 14, 28, 33 says this. Uh, so just to kind of give you a picture of the story, Jesus is out on a stroll on the ocean. He's on the beach, and he's out there walking on water. And, and, and Peter is uncertain because he's thinking that he sees a ghost. And look at what he says just to prove my point. He says, uh, Lord, is it you? That's uncertain, right? Like he didn't know. I'm like, man, you know, who's this dude walking out here? You know, is it like Yorona? What, who's, it, who's this? <laughs> You know, who is this person out there, right? Look, look at this. Lord, is it you, Peter asked? Ha, has God ever spoken something to you and you wonder if it's God who told you or was it you who thought it? See, the surest way to know it's him is to be in relationship with him. Peter asked, uh, if it is, in other words, he still wasn't sure, if it is you, if it is who you say you are, not sure, then tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. So Peter got out of the boat. Come on, got out of the boat. Some of us need to get out of our comfort, get out of our easy, get out of our predictability, get out of our hit or miss, Christian. It's time to get out of the boat. It's time to take a word from heaven and say, God, you're bid, you bid me to come and I'll do it. You tell me to do this and I'll do it. And so Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was what? He was afraid. So, so here's the truth. Obviously, his faith started out strong. He was uncertain, but he was confident. But along the way, his uncertainty got the best of his confidence. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. He began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And right away, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Aren't you glad that even when you take a step of faith, even when you miss it sometimes, come on, even when you thought you heard from heaven, even when you knew you heard from heaven and you start sinking and you start seeing things failing, that all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and he'll save you. He'll pull you up, he'll pull you out, and he'll put you right back in the boat, right? And right away Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him in your faith. He said, your faith is so small, man, what's wrong with you? He didn't say you don't have any faith. He said, it's just, it's, it's small. And how many know that right here in this room, there are different sizes of faith. And those in the boat worship Jesus are like, dang, you really must be the son of God. Peter was less certain, but he was more confident in Jesus. And so having faith doesn't mean that you're always going to stay afloat. Having faith means that there'll be times where you're walking on water and there'll be times where you're sinking. But I rather err in faith than error in staying comfortable and never doing nothing with the life that God gave me. Error in faith. Error in trust. Error in the word from heaven. Because if you don't, one day you'll wake up. See, money you can make. Time you can't get back. You only get one shot. And some of us will live to 60. Some will live to 70. Some will live to 80. Some will live to 40. Some will live. It sucks. That's life. But what are you doing with that? Because you, 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 you can't even buy back a minute right now. You can't buy back the last 30 seconds. So your greatest currency is use your time wisely and use it with faith. That was for somebody. Because if you don't step out, you'll stay bound. You'll stay bound. You'll stay bound to your ideas, your own ideologies. You'll stay bound to your fear. You'll stay bound to your doubt. Nothing wrong with doubt. 
As a matter of fact, you know what I love about Thomas? A lot of people have, you know, crap to say about doubting Thomas. You remember Thomas? T Jesus is resurrected. All the disciples, you know, are coming back. They're like, man, he's alive. He resurrected. Oh, my God. Peter's like, hey, man, you know, we had, we had uh, fish tacos on the beach. Remember when Jesus comes back, he sees Peter out fishing again. He defaulted back to his old ways. He went back to his old job. And Jesus already, this is where I know that God's all about barbecue. He, Jesus, Jesus is the one that set up the coals and the fire. And he told Peter, man, where's the fish? Man, bring the fish. And right there, Peter brought fish, and Jesus started barbecuing some pescado with salsa, limon, tortillas, and it was amazing. Well, it was pita bread, but it was good. But notice something, that when, when, when Jesus is having these different encounters with different disciples, they all had their own fresh revelation of him. Thomas is hearing all the stories from all the disciples. He's like, I don't believe that. What do you mean he's resurrected? I no, he's not. I saw him on the cross. And I love the fact, and I can relate to Thomas a little bit, because instead of him relying on the testimony of other people, he wanted his own faith. He wanted to have his own revelation. And so when Jesus shows up to the house, he was still doubting. He said, okay, you Jesus? Yes, it's me, Thomas. He's like, show me your cuts. She's like, well, here they are. He still was like, come on, man. Then he says, go ahead, you put your finger through, do whatever you want. So he did that. What am I saying? See, you got to go from a place of stop borrowing the faith of other people and start getting your own revelation. Get your, know, know Jesus for yourself. Stop knowing the Jesus of your spouse, the Jesus of your grandmother, the Jesus of your grandfather, the Jesus of your pastor, the Jesus of your leaders. What about you? Do you know Jesus? Do you know him personally? Or are you still playing and messing around and you're just like, ah, I don't know, I'm still struggling. I tell people that struggle, I'm in, listen, I come from atheism. I went to work and I dug deep in the scriptures until I found the real Jesus. Maybe you have the religious Jesus, the one that sits on your, on your neck with a little cross and that's your Jesus. No, Jesus is not on a cross. He is risen. He's risen. He's not on a bumper sticker. He's not a fish. He's risen. He's not an, he's not an altar with candles. He is the risen king and he wants a personal relationship with you. With you alone. Amen? So I like Thomas after all. Right? Let's give Thomas some love. Can we give Thomas a bit? My, you, know, you know why it's good? Because Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples. So you can be a Christian and have doubt. And guess what? Jesus is not afraid of your doubt. But you got to get a revelation of him. That he will expect from you. He'll require you to know him personally. He'll even let you put your finger in his cuts. Because just thinking faith alone is not good enough. There's a lot of people that think one day I'll start my business. One year I'll go to school. One year, I know, one year I'm going to. And you have all these pipeline dreams, but you never do nothing with them. That needs to stop. Put a little faith in that and say, you know what? In the name of Jesus, I'm going to do this thing. That's it. I'm done talking. I'm done making excuses of my past. I'm done talking about what I don't have, what I never had, who didn't love me, who didn't. Forget all that noise. Put your faith in Christ. See what you and God could do together. Partner up. Link up with Jesus and watch what he will do because I'm telling you, God is faithful. Hmm. Let me just, for sake of time, I got to get out of here. I'm going to skip some stuff. Let me just go to this. And then we'll get out of here. Y'all look tired. <laughs> why doesn't my faith work, Pastor? I hear everything you said. Why doesn't it work? Okay, let me give you some application. Here's why. You have the right, you may have the right word from heaven. But everything is about timing. Sometimes people try to birth things prematurely. I've done it where you, I got a word from God to do something, but then I got ahead of God and I did it myself thinking that I'm doing it for God because that's what he told me to do, only to flop on me. So it's not that your faith doesn't work. It's that there has to be the right time, 
there has to be the right people and you got to be at the right place right place right time right people and sometimes we have this this manipulative expectation on God just because he spoke a word that it better happen in the next 30 seconds because you said it so where's it at but faith is a process just like success has a process what do I mean by that okay let's go practical how many remember the Wright brothers the guys who built the plane just just think this no one ever heard of the terminology plane no one ever knew that you can fly something in the air with weight like a plane they were they were definitely not educated. If you study their story, they were not educated. They did not have all the technology that we have today in order to even begin to think about how to build a plane. They just had a God idea to fly a plane, to build a plane, to take humankind up in the air. And, and you know what's, what's even more interesting? They had no support. They had no financial backing. All they had was a big idea to take a big piece of something and get it to fly up in the air you know what's even more interesting you would think that they would build a plane in a big hangar right where you're supposed to build them you know where they built the first plane they built it in a bicycle shop of theirs that's where they built you know what we want we are always like well i'll start that business when i got this much capital i'll start this when i have this i'll do that and we make up all these excuses of when we're going to start these people started with whatever they had faith without works is what faith without works is what and so often you got all these kind of spiritual spooky people that are all up here in faith but they got no works they got no works at all these people are like, man, we, look, we don't care if we have a hanger. We don't care if we have all the equipment we need. They were lacking all kinds. Of, the circumstances were not good. But they built this bad boy. But check this out. Once they finished building this thing, this plane uh, in a bicycle shop, then they think this. They, they, they went out and they said, we're going to fly this thing. And look what happens to their plane. darn it <laughs> have you ever been frustrated it's like man you're like i put in all these hours i put in all this work man i had faith in god and it just crashed and burned i sunk so it must have not been god you're gonna fail forward you're gonna fail in faith sometimes but just because you fail doesn't mean that god didn't speak to you it just probably wasn't the right time. It probably wasn't the right place. Why do I say the right place? They built this, their, their first plane, or the second plane, they built it in Dayton. But guess what? They discovered something. They discovered that the, the place where they built it did not have the physics of air and wind and all that to carry the plane up in the, in the air. So you know what they did? They found a place in North Carolina that had the right wind, right the right time and the right place and then they had this amazing victory go ahead media and they start flying their plane what am i saying to you what i'm saying to you is that it's interesting how the world will take god's principles but the church won't if it works for them god god's word does not return void if it works for the world, it's because they're applying the principles and the things that God already spoke. He said, call those things that be not as though they were. They started saying, hmm, how do we fly a big metal piece up in the air? You know what, you know what they did? They did what most of us lack. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, if you want to be great at anything you're going to do, you better be a great learner. You better study. So often we want the dream, but we won't study the process. So often we want to be rich, but you won't read books. 
So often we want this, we want that, but you won't go through the process. You want to be married, but you don't know how to be married. You don't even know how to be single. But you want somebody to fix you. You want someone to lay hands on you. You want some, not, no. You dig deep in the word of God until you get a revelation from heaven because God has the answer for you. God has the wisdom for you. If you don't think that, then I don't know what gospel you're reading. You study it. You study it. You want to be good at something? You study. You want to see miracles? You study every single miracle in the Bible. You want to see victory, breakthroughs? You study every verse on faith. You want to see healing? You want, I, I, God's called me to healing ministry. Okay, great. So what are you doing now? Well, I'm just waiting on God to just tell me what to do. Okay, you're going to be waiting a long time, bro. You better open the Bible, crack it open, and start seeing every single miracle and look at the strategy. Look at the way God did it. Look at the way God used people. Look how people sacrificed. Look how they fasted. Look how they prayed. Look how they sac Look how they died to themselves. See, but we won't pay that price. I've seen many miracles. God has used us in many, many miracles at Elevate Church, beyond Elevate Church. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen dead people come back to life. Do you think that just happened because I'm God's favorite? Not his favorite, and neither are you. It happened because I started digging deep in the scriptures, spending four hours a day reading the Bible. I studied every scripture on faith. And you know what? And then an opportune time came. And then I would show up. I got a cold. Let me pray for your cold. Father, and they, uh, a few hours later, you know, cold's gone, man. Flu's gone. What the? Okay. Then we graduated from a cold to flu. Hey, uh, I can't walk. My leg is, let's pray for that leg. And, and, and I, boom, move it around. I can, man. I just got moved your leg, man. Oh, my God. People just, yeah. <laughs> then it graduated. See, that's the process. And it's graduated since then to the point where people have been healed from cancer. Recently, just a few years back, I went to one of the most difficult stretches. A girl was going to be unplugged because she was brain dead. Brain dead. Doctor said, unplug. I told the family, don't unplug. God's gonna do something crazy right now. You know how stupid that sounds? to tell a family who's already hurting and broken and you're telling them, don't unplug your daughter, don't let go of your daughter. That is not easy. It's uncomfortable. So God said, you go there and you sing. <laughs> I'm glad you know I can sing. He's like, no, not you, bring someone. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Hey, and I called one of my friends, I'm like, hey, go with me. God wants us to go sing. So we're in the room, we're singing playing guitar. I said, that's all God said to do. Do you imagine how stupid that probably looked like family? What y'all doing? We're singing. <laughs> Your daughter's dying, but we're singing. How stupid does that look? See, that's called stretch. That's called being uncomfortable. That's called being ridiculed if you're going to be ridiculed. That means you're going to be persecuted. We, we had doctors in different places where they would literally, I had one doctor one day, man, he was, you can tell he was demon possessed. He was yelling at me, don't pray in that name, yelling at me, a doctor in the hospital. I'm like, screw you, man, I'm going to pray. I ain't leaving, you ain't even getting me out of here. That girl had no movement that day. Two days later, they called me and they said, you're not going to believe this. She had a gag movement, a gag. When you gag, that means that there is brain activity. And then it went from gag to uh, all of a sudden, they're seeing some activity in the brain. And before you know it, they said, well, even if she has brain activity now, she's a vegetable. She's never going to wake up. She's going to be like this the rest of her life. You're going to feed her with tubes. She'll never talk. She'll never speak. She'll never be mobile. She'll never do nothing. And all the da 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 And we just kept praying and believing. And let me tell you something. Today, the woman... Okay. Her name is Anais. Today, the woman, she speaks, she moves, she walks, she has life. She's a business owner right now, owns her own salon. And let me tell you something, all that because we were here 
at a church that was willing to stretch even if it meant looking stupid. And I wish I, wish I could tell you that we have seen miracles work 100%. No, I haven't. But let me tell you something. The greatest miracle of any sort is salvation. Bow your head, close your eyes. Father, I thank you for each and every single person here. I pray that you would stir our heart, Father, to keep growing and to keep stretching. Lord, I pray, lift your hand to heaven. I pray, Father, that that rubber band will remind them this week to dream again, to believe again. Lord, to trust you. Lord, to encounter you again, to have a fresh revelation of who you are again. Do something new. Do something fresh. Lord, I pray that they'll see the greatest miracles in 2019, not 2020. No, they start now, now, because they're willing to stretch. They're willing to grow. They're willing to study themselves to be approved. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that we are all elevating our faith in 2019. In that same attitude, if you're here and you don't have a personal, you can put your hands down. If you don't have a personal relationship with God, listen, that's where faith starts. Right now, as you heard this message, it gave you a measure of faith to believe that there is a God who loves you, who forgives you, but it's going to take your stretch. What do I mean by that? You need to stretch out your hand to God today and say, God, save me. When Peter was sinking, he, 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 shot, he said, Jesus, save me. That was the whole purpose of Jesus going to a cross. He went and did his stretch on a cross and he took on the sins of the whole world that was his capacity he can take the sin of everyone you don't even have the capacity to take your sin and to be forgiven of it you don't have the capacity to bring restoration to your life you don't have the capacity to bring personal healing to your life but there is one and his name is Jesus and he died for the purpose of healing you, restoring you, saving you, forgiving you, and giving you a purpose and plan on this earth. If you're here and you've never done that before, you've never invited, you've never stretched your hand and said, Jesus, save my soul today. I want to know you. There's going to come a day where you're going to die. Whether you like it or not, you are going to die at some point. The question is, where are you going when you die? Do you know that you're going to heaven? If you think you're going to heaven, you're not. You have to know that you know that you know that you know that you know because you have a personal revelation that you know you're going. Today you can do that. Today you invite heaven into your heart. You invite Jesus. And you tell God, Lord, save my soul. When I count three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. Why? Because it requires a stretch. And when you stretch your hand up, you're telling God, save me. You're telling God, heal me. You're telling God, help me. And you watch, God will help you. He did it for me, ex-atheist. He'll do it for you. He loves you. He's not against you. So when I count to three, you put your hand up high in the air. I'm not going to embarrass you, but we are going to pray together. We're going to all pray as a group today, and heaven's going to flood your heart. One, stop being afraid. Two, go for the stretch. If that's you, at the count of three, lift your hand. Three, if that's you, lift it high quickly, quickly, high, quick, quick, quick. I see all those hands. I see all those hands everywhere. Awesome. You can put your hands down. I want you all to pray this with me. Everyone that lifted their hand, especially those that are around them, let's pray this. Jesus, thank you so much for stretching out your love, your forgiveness, your redemption for me. Today, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for not giving up on me and for loving me the way you have this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that lifted your hand, God bless you. That took a stretch. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.